Hello, this is Rock Our World. I'm going to attempt a, a follow-up to my last episode, and I was talking about the weapons of our warfare. And the, the big one, the one that has the, the biggest bang for your buck, is the hydrogen bomb of the kingdom of God, and that is the exercise of fasting. So I want to expand a little bit on that. I'm going to go through two, two or three or four scriptures. Two in particular, Daniel um, 10, I had pointed you towards, and also Isaiah 58. So well, let's see how we do. With it. I want to go down some rabbit trails. I want to bring out a number of different things, and, and uh, hopefully it all makes sense and ties together nicely. So let's tackle... Uh, exactly what is fasting and its purpose and I want to bring forward the idea that that the demonic world Satan and the demons and those uh, are two different things uh, one is the the fallen angels are are Satan or the Satans you can even use plurals with that these fallen angels uh, created offspring when they went outside the boundaries of God's instructions. And this is all found in the book of Enoch uh, and the book of Jasher and the book of Jubilees, a great, great expansion of Genesis 6. There's a one line in there. I should have looked it up. I'll put it in my description. But um, it says the sons of God came and... Uh, interacted was the idea with uh, sons of uh, men god and men came together and that was the fallen angels called the watchers in the book of enoch and they lusted after the human women and they took seduced uh, them and took them as wives and and had offspring by them and they these were eventually killed these offspring there were millions maybe even in the billions created in the course of time as described by Enoch and uh, God eventually uh, brought a judgment uh, the initial judgment on all of these and he killed them all in front of their fathers the fallen angels and uh, what's left is their spirit essence and that's what demons are anyway you can't find that in what you call your Bible you have to go to the book of Enoch and Jubilees and Jasher to get a further expansion of Genesis 6 and uh, further revelation. On, uh, Satan has worked hard to keep his identity uh, hidden and he is the God of this world. But God has made it possible in these last days to gain this information if you will keep moving forward, uh, break off the chains that religion puts on you. Use your, your logic and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, not the teachings of men. And uh, that's not to say that um, men aren't helpful, but when Yeshua was here, he said, I will send you the helper, referring to the Holy Spirit, and it will teach you everything. He never said that he would send men to teach us everything, or women. He told us he would send the Holy Spirit. So that's your... Uh, greatest asset as far as learning is the have the Holy Spirit help you and uh, I better get back to these two scriptures what is fasting fasting is the hydrogen bomb of the of the of the great battle the weapons of our warfare as these last days unfold in front of us we will need all of our weapons and we want to become aggressors in this battle I explained that a little bit in my last episode. We want to, and I'm going to use Matthew 11, 12 here. This has quite a spectrum of translations in all the various translations, but um, I'm going to use this idea. Um, Since John, the kingdom has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. I'll use that uh, idea that were to become aggressors in this battle not just defenders that's the idea the armor 
And when you read Ephesians 6, you find the last thing that it talks about is the sword. And the sword is uh, actually refers to the Word of God. So that's, that's a key component. You have to study the Word of God. You have to know what's written there or you will be deceived in these last days. And uh, that's achieved by reading it. And you will find, if you've never read the scriptures before, you'll find them hard to understand, but persist, because it's the Holy Spirit's job to teach you what it means. And it happens by a miracle. You read it once, and then you start reading a second time, and you'll find you start to see things and you will find by the third time you'll see a lot of things and as you meditate on these things you train your mind to spend its all its time even your dreams you'll find will be teaching you things uh, spend your mind's time on the things of god that's what meditation is and god will explain all these things to you you will learn very quickly so I'm going to go now to Daniel 10. I, I want to throw this one thought in. Satan and the demons cannot understand fasting. They are so completely selfish that uh, they cannot understand why a person would put away, resist indulging in anything that their flesh wants to satisfy their flesh. And that's in essence what Fasting is it's making a choice, conscious choice to do without something you really like uh, in a fleshly way, like food, water, uh, coffee, uh, cigarettes, <laughs> chocolate, uh, whatever. And I'll expand more on this, uh, what fasting is all about. But uh, Satan and the demons cannot understand why a human would do that because they they just go ahead and grab what they want and they uh, work hard to give us the same motivations and and attitudes that we do not go without the things we want that we grab them and we lust after them and we we hold them dear to ourselves so uh, that would be one way to describe how effective this is in driving Satan out of our lives. He cannot stand to be around us when we're fasting. And when we live a life in the attitude of fasting, which is humility and, and uh, the, the, the complete desire to follow God in every way, he, Satan and the demons will not be able to be in your presence and that's the objective we want here we want to work on ourselves and and allow god to help us achieve these things so that we get to the place where uh, as the scripture says uh, resist the devil and he will flee from us this exercise of fasting is your most effective weapon in driving satan out of your lives out of our lives, out of my life. So uh, I will go ahead and talk a little bit more, more about what fasting is, how do you go about it. In Daniel, we see Daniel 10, we see Daniel uh, choosing to fast in that case for three weeks. He he received the answer he was looking for in, at the end of three weeks, so that's why he stopped fasting. Not that he chose to fast three weeks, but he, and how he fasted was that he uh, abstained from drinking wine and fancy foods, meat, desserts, let's say. It really boiled down to all he was eating was, was vegetables. And uh, it, just a side note, it was pointed out that he and his, uh, in one case, they were healthier after they'd been fasting for a certain amount of time. That is another part of Daniel, but uh, Daniel was seeking revelation. He, uh, if you read the whole chapter there, um, actually read 9 and 10, but in chapter 10, he wanted, he could see that they were supposed to return to the land of Israel after 70 years of captivity. And he, the 70 years was were up and he wanted to know 
uh, why things weren't happening. He was pressing in on the Lord for a revelation. And I will point you to Daniel uh, 10, 12. Uh, it's uh, in the various translations. You'll find that, that Daniel was seeking to gain understanding and to humble himself. That's, that's the words that the angel was speaking with Daniel. And he used those that terminology. And we know from another scripture that God gives grace to the humble. That is an important aspect of our character that God wants to develop in us to become humble. And uh, that is one of the ways that fasting is described, is to humble oneself. So that is one of the things we're seeking in fasting is revelation to gain understanding. And we do uh, that by humbling ourselves. And then uh, I'll point you to Isaiah 58, uh, verse 6. To break the chains of understanding, to let the oppressed go free, to break off every yoke. These is uh, these are metaphoric language. This is metaphoric language, and we're talking about uh, getting rid of sin would be maybe the most succinct way to describe what we're doing. We're getting rid of the things that keep us in prisons and bind us. And uh, there's that could be described in all kinds of ways. There's generational curses that are following us around in our families. There's all kinds of things that hinder us and, and uh, oppress us. And we feel like we're in prisons and that we're, we're bound by chains. And fasting will break these things off. And uh, a word of encouragement, we rarely see an instant result from fasting. Fasting is more of an investment in the future. But we will see them. And um, in my walk with God, I did a lot of fasting back about 20 years ago. And I did actually see some pretty amazing things. Um, I'll just tell you this one short story. I A lot of times when you are feeling an urgency or a, a push or a, um, a sense that you're supposed to begin a fast, you won't necessarily know what it's for. And you'll feel more the urgency or the, the drawing of the Lord to do it and less so why you're doing it. But it is for a, a purpose, and you will uh, likely find that out in the future. But in this one case, I I had fasted for 40 days twice in, back in those years. And um, the one time I did it, I it was one of those situations. I didn't really know what it was about, but I felt this urgency and this pressing. And... Um, there had been a breakdown in a relationship that happened just as I was feeling all this in uh, between two family members, and it was very, very serious. And uh, there was a uh, an offense and a breaking of this relationship. And anyway, I thought oh, maybe that's what this is about, you know. And, at, on the 39th day of this fast, the, the one person in this broken relationship called the other one and was weeping and, and said, uh, and the other one said, well, what's wrong? And the answer on the phone was, uh, we're wrong. The, the thing between us is wrong. And he apologized and there was a, there was a, a mending of that relationship on the 39th day of that fast. Anyway, that was one of the more remarkable things that uh, in the past. But uh, I remember Jonathan Kahn and uh, Sid Roth. Uh, Sid was talking about this, how they, in their early days, I think around when they were 20-ish, uh, 20 years old, they're now in their 70s, I believe. They did a lot of fasting, and they said the same thing. We really didn't know why we were doing it. But now, today, 50 years later, here they both have very 
successful, very effective ministries. And uh, it would be a good thing to follow both Sid Roth and Jonathan Kahn a little bit. Um, Jonathan Kahn has a lot of prophetic gifting, and Sid Roth has a program that draws together a lot of uh, people with unique and godly experiences, and uh, uh, there's a lot to be learned from both of them. Uh, I would put both of those in the class of the Spirit of Elijah that I've talked about a lot. Okay, uh, I think I've covered the idea of fasting, its purposes, as well as I wanted to. This is our objective, to get rid of sin in our lives, to receive revelation from the Lord, to humble ourselves, to break the chains that bind us, and uh, set the captives free. We're the captives. We're the ones in chains and bondages. We, we don't necessarily know what they are, what's causing these things. And fasting is a thing that breaks this. And again, you won't necessarily see the results immediately. It's something you do in faith. And I'm going to read Isaiah 58, a section here, so out of uh, the JPS. No, and this is Isaiah 58. I'm going to start in 6 and read to uh, the end of 8. No, this is the fast I desire, to unlock fetters of wickedness and untie the cords of the yoke, which is lawlessness, which is without Torah. That's what lawlessness means, without the Torah. To let the oppressed go free, to break off every yoke, that is to overcome. Uh, go to the book of Revelation to, to see what the Lord says about overcoming. That's what his people are to do. It is to share your bread with the hungry and to take the wretched poor into your home when you see the naked to clothe him and not to ignore your own kin. Then shall your light burst through like the dawn and your healing spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall march before you, and that's with a capital V, so that's the Lord, your vindicator. And the presence, again, a capital P, the presence of the Lord, that would be the Holy Spirit of the Lord, shall be your rear guard. That's, I, again, that's Isaiah 58, uh, verse 6, all the way to the end of verse 8. And that is... Picturesque metaphoric language, but it's quite clear what uh, what the Lord is talking about, and to expand it into your understanding that you <clears throat> would see what is achieved by fasting, and and uh, <clears throat> grab hold of the concept that it's the most powerful thing you can do in your advancement in the kingdom of God defeating the kingdom of Satan. Now, I pointed this out in the last program, the last episode, that you cannot divorce any of these weapons from each other. You have to do all of them. There's five of them I went through. I went through reading the Word of God, and that, if you want to pick one that's more important than the others, that would, I would say that's it, but you can't have one and not the others. And the Word of God is not useful if the Holy Spirit doesn't explain it. So you have to be inviting and work with the Holy Spirit. It will teach you all things. And you have to read all, right from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. And as I've said, once you have that, I would encourage you to go to the book of Enoch and the book of Jasher at very least. Uh, those by... My estimation, and hopefully the lot you can follow the logic, they are to be part of the Word of God. They were removed, they were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls for a good reason, because they are part of the, the collection of what we would call the Word of God. And then to carry on with the, the weapons, we have prayer, we have meditation, and I want to spend a little bit more time on on small group studies. I talked a 
bit about that in the, these five weapons. And then the last one is the, is the hydrogen bomb is fasting. But uh, the small group study is important because you need an environment where it's small enough everybody can participate, get involved in the discussion. And that's where you'll see the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate in your discussions. You get a topic, and I've suggested you watch my episodes as a uh, just watch an episode and then discuss things I went through. You know, you pick them, but you can use any resource the Lord leads you in. There's thousands and upon thousands of resources out there, but the Holy Spirit will lead you to the one He wants you or it wants you to uh, work with. God is the only one that sees the whole picture. He's a trillion times smarter than we are, so that is the best way to do everything, is take it to the Lord first and follow his lead. Learn to hear his voice, and that's in essence, essence how we're learning to hear God's voice. You ask the question, and then you follow where your heart is speaking to you. And when you're working with a group of people, that uh, is even more effective because if everybody's feeling the same thing, you have confirmation of where you're headed. So in the small group, these things are achieved very readily. You'll see the Holy Spirit work powerfully in a small group, but this doesn't mean you uh, ditch your church community. And uh, again, the Holy Spirit will teach you what it wants you to do in regards to that. But I would say off the top that your church community is going to go through a crisis very soon. All of uh, the world's churches, both in the Christian and Jewish worlds, are going to go through a crisis right ahead of us. God is going to call to account the leaders. You'll read about that in Ezekiel 34. And those who eat the sheep, that is, their hirelings, they work for pay rather than for the Lord. They will be dismissed if they don't change. And those who muddy the waters, that is, they teach false doctrines. They simply teach what they were taught rather than study the scriptures and ask the Holy, have the Holy Spirit explain what they are, uh, the meanings, the meaning of the scriptures. So uh, this crisis is right ahead of us. And uh, if you get Rick Joyner's vision, the Final Quest trilogy, there's a, a very good description of how this is all going to unfold that when this uh, one in one place he called the lord revealed it would be like the civil war that it will appear the church is uh, faltering and failing as this uh, correction comes upon it i've described this as the white horse this is directly ahead of us and uh, we will need true leaders and you could very well be one of them that are uh, waiting in the wings, in the background, learning <clears throat> from the Holy Spirit and ready to help out when this crisis hits. And that doesn't mean that every church leader and every pastor will be dismissed, but if they don't change, if they don't correct the things that are wrong, they will be dismissed. And uh, there will be a need for leaders. And if you read, when you read Ezekiel 34, you'll see that the Lord has prepared ahead of time uh, shepherds after his own heart. So our prayer is that uh, the present shepherds will go along with the changes. They will allow the Lord to correct them just as he has um, myself. And there's, there's got to be lots out there that are going through the same process. The Lord's preparing ahead of time, showing these things. Uh, one of the uh, really important things that it would be worthwhile doing would be to order that ain't that is the um, Andrew Ross project of the Aramaic English New Testament that is the only uh, good translation of the original Aramaic documents that we call the New Testament the Greek versions all have a great deal of error in them and a lot of that error is very purposeful. It was dishonestly done. The Lord has allowed this until this last, this late date, and now he is correcting it. 
this work that Andrew Roth did was done over a number of years and he's now I believe in the fifth edition so that would be good if you could get the most recent edition I have the third one and it's very good yeah uh, so get get a copy of that and start unraveling the lie that Jesus did away with the Torah and that as I keep saying, goes hand in hand with the lie that the New Testament was written in Greek. These are lies. They were uh, put in place 1,700 years ago, and they have carried on to today, and now they're being un uncovered, and it's now the responsibility of all uh, church leaders, pastors, and so on, to correct these things in their churches in their lives and they're not re they're not guilty of the lie themselves they have inherited that lie these lies but now they're responsible for correcting it now that they know so hang around in your church community unless the lord tells you otherwise and be there to help when this great civil war erupts and the Lord goes, takes us all through this great sorting out. And in essence, that's what the great tribulation is for, is to create the first fruits. And so I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes talking about, uh, I, my last episode, I explained um, how to find, go through the 51 day count and find uh, the uh, feast of first fruits. Uh, and the Feast of Weeks, and how it is a prophecy of the Great Tribulation in the counting of these seven weeks. Right now we are on the sixth day of Unleavened Bread here. It is April uh, 8th, 9th, sorry. And tomorrow is going to be the last day of Unleavened Bread. April 10th will be the last day, and it is a and it was it is an appointed time of the Lord it's a day that we don't work we we rest and we uh, do what would be appropriate if you can get together with other believers and talk about what the days of unleavened bread mean how Yeshua our our Savior who uh, is in uh, is the first of the first fruits he rose on the day of the feast of first fruits and then he dealt and I've developed this idea, he, do, he dealt with half the problem of sin. Some would argue with me on that. I'm just developing an idea that he rose halfway through the days of unleavened bread. He rose in the third day. There was still four days to go. And the idea is that he dealt with our past sins and our future mistakes. But he did not deal with sin in our lives, uh, the part that we have to do something. So we have to take up the the challenge and we have to spend a lifetime getting rid of sin in our lives and that's what the Lord's talking about in the book of Revelation when he tells all the churches to be overcomers we are to overcome sin in our lives and sin is the transgression of the Torah if you will choose to be honest and read the entirety of the of what Christians call the New Testament the I call them the apostolic writings you will see clearly that the followers of Jesus, the disciples and those that were raised up uh, subsequently, all of these people were keeping these feasts. That's very obvious. They were keeping the Days of Elam Bread. They were keeping the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, which was um, deceitfully misnamed Pentecost. They were keeping the Fall Feasts. I've gone through a lot of these points in various episodes, but <clears throat> you have to be honest that with yourselves that they were uh, all keeping these feasts because Jesus taught them to. And uh, I want to just mention the Day of Atonement. That is the one day every year that we are commanded to fast. And that fast is done without both water and food whereas most fasts would entail not eating food but uh, as point as pointed out with daniel's fast that you can choose uh, 
and have the Lord lead you in all this. You figure out what you're going to do without. But <clears throat> your basic fast would be without food for whatever length of time the Lord's leading you in. And but on the Day of Atonement, we're to fast for a twenty, basically a twenty-four hour period of time from sunset to sunset, and we're to be without water and food for that almost 24 hour period of time. So I think I got it all covered and I want to point out too that uh, when you read about the feasts in Deuteronomy 16 and 23 and many many other places throughout scripture and the, the books of Enoch, book of Jasher, Jubilees and so on you will see that these feasts were put in place long before Mount Sinai and uh, that they are the Lord's feast. They don't belong to the Jewish people, like they call it. You're probably familiar with the term Yom Kippur, if I pronounce it properly. That is a Hebrew transliteration of the words that in English mean the Day of Atonement. And they are the, these are the Lord's feasts. Anyone who is a believer in the God of Israel who is Jesus Christ needs to be keeping these appointed times. See, I'm over 30 minutes, so I'll call that a wrap. This is Rock Our World.